You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. And then in Joel 2.32, it says, It'll come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered for on Mount Zion. And in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape. As the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. So the Lamb is standing with the 144,000 who have escaped death through the entire tribulation period. We're seeing a fulfillment of what it says in the book of Joel, right off the bat. The Lamb is standing as conqueror. Why do we even need the Old Testament? Some people believe that the Old Testament is useless because we don't follow Old Testament law anymore. Jesus came to earth and died for your sins so that you wouldn't have to do animal sacrifices or special rituals. So why even bother reading the Old Testament? Well, today, Pastor Ken is going to remind you of the incredible prophecies that are written in the Old Testament and how they are fulfilled in the New Testament Scripture. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Revelation chapter 14 as he continues his message. Now for a word from our sponsor. Remember what we saw in the previous chapter? And this is, this is kind of the contrast. In the previous chapter, as uh, and Dr. Seiss saw this, over against the confessions and worshipers of the beast, having his mark, is the Lamb's followers who have his written name and the name of the Father on their foreheads. They haven't been stamped, it's been written. We'll talk about that again. Over against the beast's moral system, which is anything goes, it's harlotry, uh, to put it in good 1913 terms, it's harlotry, spiritual and literal, the worship of idols and the trampling underfoot of all, of all God's institutes. But what we have here with the 144,000 is a group of men who have remained pure. They have not failed, unlike others who have. Now, the Lamb, of course, is Jesus Christ. We know that. And we saw that they're, brand, they're not branded. Remember the beast? He brands. This is written. It's a mark. Remember, as we took a look at it in the Greek, there are two different words that are at play. The first word is the one that's used here. It's in, it's in regard to the 144,000. We saw it in Revelation 7. We're seeing it now in Revelation 14. And they're sealed with a mark. It's fragus manile, if you want to look at it again in the Greek. It comes from a Greek word which is fragitso. It just means to provide with a seal as a security measure, to close up something. Uh, literally, the mark denotes ownership and carries with it the protection of the owner. Okay? And it's written. So I don't know if it's the same mark that we see in the book of Ezekiel, which was the letter tau, in the Greek and the Hebrew alphabet, which looks like a T. Interesting, everybody's marked with a cross. But this is, this is something that is specifically sealing these 144,000. The word used for the mark of the beast, though, is karagma. And it means a brand. Okay? A mark that's engraved or etched. And we even talked about one of the possible definitions of it is the bite of a serpent and it's the scar that's left when the serpent bites. So uh, it could be any of that. So we see these 144,000 with the Lamb, and they're standing on Mount Zion. What do we see about Mount Zion throughout the Scriptures? Well, we see that it is the place that God has specifically chosen to have His throne in the future. He says in Psalm 2, 6-12, which is an interesting conversation between the three persons of the Trinity talking about what's going on during this time period. It says, as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion. This is God talking about Jesus being installed on Mount Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. So we're seeing a picture in Revelation 14 of what he's talking about in Psalm chapter 2. We're seeing the film footage of it now. That's what John's telling us about. 
Jesus has been installed as king on Mount Zion. God's going to have his throne there. You saw that in the book of Ezekiel. And he's talking about it here in Psalm 2. You are God telling him, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all those who take refuge in him. This is Mount Zion. The temple is way over here. That's the Temple Mount area. You're actually seeing an edge of it right there. But this right here is Mount Zion. Doesn't look like much of a mount today, but it is, okay? If you look closer, yes, there's a graveyard there. Orthodox Boys School. I don't know if where Jesus is is at the Orthodox Boys School or if he's at the Protestant Cemetery. But all that's Mount Zion. And, and of course, you have the Tomb of David. The upper room is there. All of that was the city of David prior to the fall of Israel taken by the Babylonians, okay? So everybody in David's day knew there was a lot of real estate north of Zion, even in, in Israel. Second, while Zion's beautiful, it's not exactly the tallest mountain there. Well, it's not beautiful now with all the stuff that's on it. But it's not the tallest peak. The Temple Mount is 100 feet lower than Mount Zion. It's 2,428 feet. Mount Zion's 2,528 feet. The Western Hill was thought to be a more fitting place for his, for his palace. It was renamed that in, in the first century. Then they found out, nope, nope, it's over here. So the highest spot, which is the Mount of Olives, Mount Zion's 300 feet lower than that. So, okay. Now, how many references do we have in the book of Revelation of Mount Zion? This is it. There are no others. This is the only reference in the book of Revelation. that it's just one of the mountains of Jerusalem, not all of them. It's the fortress, though. It's where the fortress was. David captured it when he captured the city from the Jebusites. It became known as the city of David. Solomon took the ark out of Zion and put it in the temple. And he could see the temple from his home, which was slightly higher and looking down into the temple grounds. So he could see it from there. But Zion is a fortress. This is a military picture. Okay? This is a picture coming right out of the scriptures. We'll get to it here in the book of Revelation when we start talking about something called the Battle of Armageddon, which I don't believe happens at Armageddon. I think it's happening in Jerusalem. I think there's a lot of evidence that talks about that. Psalm 48, verses 2 to 11, we see Mount Zion again. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the far north. It's not in the far north. Okay? But that's what the psalmist says. The city of the great king. God in her palaces has made himself known as a stronghold. For lo, the kings assembled themselves. They passed by together. They saw it. Then they were amazed. They were terrified and they fled in alarm. Again, a picture of what's going to happen at the end of the age. So if we go forward a little bit from that. We see Isaiah 2 2. It'll come about in the last days. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. In other words, government. Chief of all the government. Mountain here is being used as government as well. And will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And then in Joel 2.32, it says, It'll come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered for on Mount Zion. And in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape. As the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. So the Lamb is standing with the 144,000 who have escaped death through the entire tribulation period. We're seeing a fulfillment of what it says in the book of Joel, right off the bat. The Lamb is standing as conqueror. He's standing on Mount Zion. This is probably after the events of Zechariah 14, 4 and 5. Zechariah 14, 4 and 5 is Jesus Christ comes to planet Earth, he places his foot on the Mount of Olives, and it splits in two. And a huge terraforming activity begins. Because if you've read Ezekiel chapters 40 to 45, you see that whole area gets changed dramatically. There's this huge plain that will be established 
right there, and that'll be a valley that goes all the way down to the Dead Sea. There'll be a river that goes through it that starts in the temple. This is probably right after that, possibly. There's a lot of room for 144,000 people once it's flat. So they've all shown up. Now, whether it's, whether it's before the finality of Armageddon or this is during the mop-up period that takes about 45 days after the end before the, the beginning of the millennial reign, don't know. But these 144,000 are standing with their king. And they were sealed back in chapter 7. So we now are being given a vision, and all those who are going through this are being given a vision that Jesus wins. All 144,000 evangelists make it to the end, and they'll be there with him on the mount. Those who are looking at the face of three and a half more years of darkness, that is encouragement. To know that your king, Jesus, is going to be standing right there on Mount Zion with all 144,000 evangelists. Not one will be left. Not one will be missed. They'll all be there. These are the same guys that we saw back in Revelation 7. And this is, again, the area that in Ezekiel, it's going to be the future throne room area on planet Earth once Eden is reestablished. We see that in the book of Ezekiel. We also see here in the scripture, and there's all kinds of back and forth when you start looking at commentaries, and sometimes it's easier just to read what the language actually says. It says that they're virgins. Okay. You're about to go through seven years of literally hell on earth. Is that a good time to go and get married? Apparently, 144,000 guys have said, nah, probably not. And they're pure. They've kept themselves pure, especially when you stop and think that prior to this, you think we have confused sexuality. Now it's going to get worse before it gets better. So these guys have kept themselves pure in light of all of the confusion that's going on today, as well as the confusion that will be going on then. This is the exact opposite of what happened in Genesis 6. In Genesis 6, there were a group of holy angels, watchers, who descended and became corrupted. Now you have people, men, who supposedly are corrupted, and they're going to remain holy. The exact opposite. This is an undoing of what started back in Genesis chapter 6. It's an anti-type, if you want to look at it that way. Holy ones, watchers, came to earth, and they defiled themselves. And they took off what we as believers want to put on. You know, eternality is what, it was what they took off. As Dr. Heiser says, where the fallen angels lusted after the daughters of men and took for themselves wives and defiled themselves and abandoned God's order. And of course, in First Enoch, it says the angels should not have taken wives from the daughters of men. They defiled themselves. They had strange children, giants, Nephilim, because of it. They have no needs of wives. They're immortal. Why do they need wives? But men need them to perpetuate the species. So we have this negative imagery of these folks during Enoch's time who descend and become defiled. And here we have 144,000 who are of man, who they came to defile, who aren't defiled when it's all said and done. It's an anti-image. They're still ritually pure. As he says, the theological point is that the 144,000 holy ones who fight the beast are counterpoints to the holy ones who rebelled and defiled themselves with human women. John tells us the holy ones will help their earthly compatriots defeat the beast, and they rectify the impurity brought by the watchers in, in trying to be reinforced by the beast. And I have there for you to read that section out of Enoch uh, chapter 15. I'm not going to go into it, but it's a diatribe as to what they did when they came to planet Earth. Now, Isaiah 14, 13 and 14, we saw the term north show up one time in one of the Psalms. This is getting back to what Satan wants to do. What, remember, we talked about that, what Satan desired he wanted to do. He, there are these things he said, I will be, I will be. And most of that's been taken away from him now because Michael kicked him out. Now, he said, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. 
I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'll make myself like the Most High. Satan's goal, when you take a look at the Hebrew, is that he wants to sit on Mount Zephon. That's, the, that's what that is, the recesses of the north. In fact, in the New International Version, it's actually translated that way, utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. Mount Zaphon's a real place. It exists. and exists today. What was one of the goals of Satan? Well, you know, when Michael drop kicked him out of the heavenlies, it kind of ended it. He no longer can establish his throne on a mount to be counter to what God is going to do on Mount Zion. And in fact, he has his own city, too, that we'll have an angel come and talk about it. That city is the city of man, Babylon, which is a picture that we see throughout the scriptures as well. But his goal was to make Mount Zephon into an infernal Mount Zion. He wanted to be higher than Mount Zion. Mount Zephon is higher than Mount Zion in terms of height. And it's also in the north. It's a perceived spiritual dark place. Looking at the Dictionary of Deities and Demons gives you some information about it that this is where Baal's throne was supposed to be. Now, Baal is Satan. One of the he's he's just he's just impersonating some other god. That's what these guys did. Seventy of them. But the peak is often shrouded with clouds, and it was regarded as the the place that Baal hangs out. Now, Mount Zaphon literally exists on the border between Syria and Turkey. So just north of that peak, right there, that's Turkey. But that's where it sits. It's a real place. And there are ruins up there that Baal was worshipped at the top of that hill. In their tradition in, in that part of the world, in Mesopotamia, they say it received its holiness because Baal's palace was there. It's mentioned always with Baal as his holy abode. And in fact, they go into great detail in one of their texts saying, Baal sits at like the base of a mountain. Had settles as the ocean in the midst of his divine mountain, Zaphon. There it is, Zaphon, Mount Zaphon, in the midst of the Mount of Victory. Again, trying to say this is where he's going to be. And even the Mesopotamians were talking about it prior to Abraham. They were, they were writing about it. So specifically, Baal's home was a mountain. Today we know it as Jabal al-Akra, if you want to look it up. It's north of that area. It's where he held counsel and ruled over the gods of the Canaanite pantheon. In other words, it's where Satan met with his infernal divine counsel. Remember, he has no original ideas. God had his heavenly host, well, Satan had his own too. And that's supposedly where he met with them. By the way, the word Baal means... Lord or owner. So this is consistent all the way in, starting way back, going into the Old Testament and then looking at what we see in the book of Revelation. Baal is Satan. And when you start studying, like we talked about Apollo and Apollyon and all of that, and how that you see that spill over in Greek mythology, Baal has other names too. Marduk, Adu, Hadad, there are several other names that he's gone by, and they're all Satan, all of them. It's interesting to note that you can't tie Molech to Satan. You can tie him to another fallen divine being. And Allah is actually more of a consortium of fallen divine beings rather than just one. It is the moon god, which has been around for a long, long time. Well, the fallen angel who thinks he's the moon god but uh, now they use this name Allah, and it, it, it's all false. It's phony, uh, which is all of Satan's thing all along, is to lie, cheat, steal, kill. That's what, he, that's what his modus operandi is. It never has changed. Every time Israel's been invaded, with the exception of Egypt, it always came from the north. So uh, the north to them was a bad, bad place, always. The part of Israel that split off was the northern kingdom led by the tribe of Dan. And the tribe of Dan were the first ones to be idol worshippers. 
So it's interesting to note that of all the tribes mentioned that are part of the 144,000, the tribe of Dan is not. And there are some folks who have tried to say, well, that's because the Antichrist comes from Dan. No, Dan was the first to go into idolatry. They were the ones that led the rest of the nation that direction. We even see the beginning of it in the book of Judges. They didn't stay where they were supposed to be after Samson, who was from the tribe of Dan, blew it. They went north, and they grabbed the Levite, who was also an uh, idol worshiper, and they established their own base of operations up in the north. When the people first took the land, they attacked somebody in the north, in the Golan Heights. His name was Og. He was 13 feet tall, little guy. And then, of course, in Genesis 6, we have all those fallen angels that show up on Mount Hermon, which is in the same area in the north, and they have their offspring called Nephilim. The book of Enoch, of course, tells us it's Mount Hermon. And for a Jew, looking at why Jesus did what he did and where he hung out most of the time and why he went to places in the north, he was specifically attacking demonic strongholds and destroying what it was that they had done. Why did he go across the Sea of Galilee to save one guy who was possessed by thousands of demons? Well, he destroyed the demonic presence that was there, and he also destroyed the entire uh, economy of idol worship as all the pigs that they would sacrifice wound up drowning in the Sea of Galilee. Two, two prong hit. The 144,000 is an anti-type. It's a reversal of the watchers. The watchers came and corrupted man. The 144,000 are part of the removal of that and part of the victory that God is going to have. They're pure. The watchers defiled themselves. The watchers corrupted the world to the point that the only way that they could be dealt with is God had to start all over again with eight people. But the 144,000 are those who God selected from man they're all Jews, they're part 12,000 from each tribe, and they're going to remain pure. The angels that fell did not remain pure. They were supposed to remain pure, but man, who is supposed to have a sin nature, these 12, 144,000 will remain pure, and they'll go through the entire tribulation that way. Now, we also have to remember something that Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 36 to 39. He tells us that this time period of the end of the age is going to be just like the days of Noah. When the Son of Man comes, it's going to be just like the days of Noah. Well, yeah, there were Nephilim, there were giants, there were all of these, there was sexual confusion going on everywhere. And it's going to be like that as well at the end of the age. In the days of Noah, even to the point of, here's 144,000 to combat the how many, however many it was that came down the Mount Hermon to corrupt man, well, it's going to be just like that, except it's going to be an anti-type of it. The victory of the 144,000, which is prophesied here in Revelation 14, points to the overturning of the corruption of Genesis 6. The watchers failed. God's selected evangelists will succeed. And those who are going through the Great Tribulation need to know that. They need to know that the demon armies... They're going to they're, they're gonna be taken care of. And if you've, in, in, in our discussions, talking about where did demons come from, well, the book of Enoch, again, talks about the demons are the spirits of the Nephilim who were destroyed as a result of the flood. You've been listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken. As you've been listening to this message, you might have some questions about what you've been hearing from the book of Revelation. That's not uncommon. Revelation is one of those books that can cause you to scratch your head and think, huh? That's why it's so good to have resources that can help you navigate the confusing things that our finite minds can't always fathom. If you'd like some additional direction, head over to theunsafebible.com and go to the About tab. There, you'll get a better understanding of what our core beliefs are, and you can even fill out a contact form. Someone can then get in touch with you and try to help answer those questions you have. 
If you're in the Jupiter, Florida area and would like to connect in person, you can look on our website for more details as to where to meet and when. In the meantime, you can find more messages from this series in Revelation by going to theunsafebible.com and looking under the media tab. Pastor Ken has more fascinating things to share from this book. And be assured, it's no accident that this book is in the Bible. God wants to teach you more about His goodness, His grace, His power, and His authority throughout the prophetic book of the Bible. So be prepared to get strapped in for Prophecy 101 as Pastor Ken continues next time. Our hope is that you'll grow and even be excited for the next edition because of what you learn and are challenged by in the depth of revelation here on The Unsafe Bible.